Hebrews chapter 2. Get your hand up high if you need a Bible. Uh, tonight we are going to finish chapter 2 and we're going to do all of chapter 3. So saddle up. Saddle up. Here we go. All right. Okay, let's, uh, let's all stand together. And uh, I'm going to read verse 10, and then we're going to pray. Bible says this, 2.10 Hebrews, For it was fitting for him whom are all things and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. Father, thank you, God. We, we just can't say thank you enough. And all of our gratitude is rooted in the person of your son. And, and we need your help, God. We get distracted so easily. And I pray tonight that you would call us, God. I pray we would hear your song of love to our hearts tonight as you sing to your sons and daughters and call our attention back to the captain of our salvation, uh, to the one who endured, to the one who suffered, to the one who condescended, to the one who left the glory and adulation of angels in heaven and, and took on the form of a man. I pray tonight that all of the other stuff, God, all of the noise, all the jangling of our culture, all of the confusion within our own lives, God, the many voices that are vying for our attention would just fade away. God, speak to us and and like the wind that drives the chaff away, blow those other voices away so that the only one that we hear is your voice, God. And the only face that we see is that of your son. God, we want to, we want to fasten our attention onto him. And so, God, we pray that your word would do that in our lives tonight, that, that there would be something spiritual that you do, God, in our lives tonight that causes your word to rise up, your truth to rise up within us, and that, God, we would hunger for it, God. We would, we would pant for it as the deer pants for the brooks of water. Lord, we bless your name, and we thank you that you're with us tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated tonight. Well, let me reiterate to you the purpose of the writing of this book, and um, though we may not be able to definitively say who the author, the, the human author was, although some of us probably have our opinions, and I certainly have mine, um, ultimately we know that the author of the book is God himself. It's God breathed, you know, from chapter 1, verse 1, all the way to the end of chapter 13. And, and the, the heart of the author of the book was this. He was writing to, he was deeply concerned. He was deeply concerned for a group of people. Uh, they were Hebrews who had put their trust and, and faith in Yeshua as their Messiah. And, and you know, that, that meant a lot of suffering for them. There was a cost with that, that they were enduring and that they were dealing with and, and the persecution that they were undergoing. And, uh, and you know, it was social persecution. It was economic persecution. Later on in Hebrews chapter 12, he says to them that they hadn't suffered under bloodshed um, as they were dealing with the issue of sin. But but there was um, certainly the, the beginnings of physical persecution and all of these things, the difficulty and the drama and the pressure in their lives was beginning to, they allowed this, all right? It wasn't as if the circumstances had the authority to do this in their lives. They had yielded the authority to the circumstances and they had begun to drift incrementally. It began incrementally. They began to drift from their faith in Jesus Christ. And there was this trajectory that they were on that the author was deeply concerned about. And so this book really is, it's a warning to these believers. And it's a, it is a, it's a wake up call. It's a clarion call to them that they're heading down this path 
that will lead them away from the fulfillment of the promises of God in their life. And, and this was why it wasn't that they were just struggling with the issue of sin. It was that they were beginning to uh, depart from God in unbelief. They were looking back. This is what I mean by that. They were beginning to look back to the Old Testament system as, as, as Hebrews. They were beginning to look back to, to angels and to Moses and to the high priestly order and system and to the old covenant. And so what this author does, look, and you've got to get this. You know, we're going we're gonna to roll through this book uh, pretty quickly, uh, but I will tell you, man, we could take two years and go through this book, and it still wouldn't be enough time. It's, it's just that good, and it's that deep. Uh, and I want to encourage you, you know, you might not have a particular book that you're reading in your devotional time. This is a great book for you to read and just soak it in. Like every verse in this book is extraordinary. But what he does, and you know, it's, it's interesting to consider as well that within the first century of um, the existence of the church, you know, they had a pretty sophisticated theology. I mean, this guy's, this guy's uh, no bozo. Like he knows his theology and he definitely knows his Old Testament. And so he methodically, this is what he's doing, he's methodically going through and he's proving beyond a shadow of a doubt how Jesus is greater. You know, that's the, that's the theme of um, the study for us. Jesus is greater. And he lays this out, you know, in chapter one, we discovered that um, God the Father says all of these things about the Son in the Old Testament, that he is Elohim, that he is God. He's, he is the second person of the triune Godhead, that he is Yahweh, um, that he is greater than angels. Uh, and methodically, you know, this is what we see the author to, the, to, to this book doing as he goes one by one and he proves, you know, he really does. He's engaging their mind because you know that, that as we worship the God of the Bible, he's not called us to just discard our mind or our intellect. This is part of how we worship him. The mind and the heart are tied together. Uh, but he is methodically going through and proving how great Jesus is to kind of, in a way, pull them back, right? To pull them back. Hey, you guys are on this trajectory. It's going to end in a bad place. You don't want to be there. And so I'm pulling you back. I'm pulling your attention back so that your life is centered on, on Jesus, who is the Son of God, the captain of your salvation, and so, you know, in chapter one, we talked about how exalted and how uh, lofty he is, his deity. And then in, in chapter two, uh, we began to look at his condescension that although he is God, um, he is also God incarnate, that he took this immense step and he spanned eternity in him, himself and he left the glory of heaven and he came here to this earth. Um, and, you know, this is the, we were just singing Christmas songs, and this really obviously is um, the, the theme of Christmas, that God did this amazing thing for us in delivering his son to this earth. And not just that Jesus lived a perfect life, but he died a perfect death for you and for me. But there was a reason, there was a purpose in his suffering. And so in chapter two, is, as we finish this chapter, we're gonna talk about the purpose of his suffering. And then in chapter three, there's a really, really strong exhortation because you know that as God expresses knowledge and gives you information, uh, the heart of God is that you're going, and I'm going to apply it to our lives. Like God doesn't just, God, the, the Bible is not, does not exist just to inform us. The Bible exists to transform us. Amen? Okay, that's D.L. Moody. I can't take credit for that one, but that, yeah, that's good, huh? I, I read that. You're like, dang, pastor, you're smart. No, not really. That's not my quote. But, but the Bible is not just for our information. The Bible is for our transformation. God wants to, God wants to change us. He wants to transform us. You can have a, a head full of the Word of God, but listen, if you and I don't apply it to our lives, it means nothing. It means nothing. I don't care how many books of the Bible you might have memorized. You, could, you can know all the original languages, but if you and I are not applying worse, listen, worse, because one day we're going to be held accountable. So, so chapter 3, what he does, and you're like, can't we just get into the book? And the answer is yes. Here we go. Okay, verse 10. For it was fitting for him whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing, bringing many sons 
Um, and look, by that, obviously, he, he's talking about the children of God, right? You and me, sons and daughters of the living God, and bringing many of us uh, to glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. And so, so the author is simply saying this, it was right for God. It was right for God to do this, to, to send his son to this earth, and that his son, who is the captain of our salvation, he is the forerunner. He is preeminent. He has gone before us. Uh, he is the one who orchestrated it, and he's the one who commands it. And it was right for God to perfect him through suffering. Now, uh, the word perfect does not mean that, that Christ was imperfect in a moral sense. What it means is that through his suffering, he fulfilled or completed or finished what was necessary to be the full substitution for our sins. So that when it was all said and done, listen, so that it was all said and, when it was all said and done, he could say these words from the cross, it is finished, right? He was able to say that because he endured suffering. Um, his, his earthly ministry was made complete through that. It's interesting, you know, as you think about the suffering of Jesus Christ, uh, by the word, this word suffering is used nine times uh, throughout these chapters. Um, this, this word suffering, pathema, it speaks specifically of the crucifixion so the focal point always of the suffering of Christ is the crucifixion. And in this chapter, this is what we discover, that Jesus Christ, as he suffered, there are four things that he accomplished. Number one, his suffering allowed him to identify with us. His suffering allowed him to identify with us. Number two, his suffering, through his suffering, he destroyed the devil and the devil's power, we're going to see that his power was the power of death. Um, through his suffering, number three, he became the perfect substitute for you and for me. Uh, this, is the, this is what Martin Luther call, called the great substitution, that he died in our place. And number four, as we think about the suffering of Jesus Christ, it also enables him to aid those who are tempted. We're going to see that in this chapter as well that he's able to be our high priest. He's able to identify um, with those struggles and those issues that we endure in this life because he walked the same path as you uh, do and as I do. It was fitting for God to do that. That Greek word is prepo. It means to be right. It made sense because ultimately what the father was doing through the son was, was bringing many sons and daughters to glory. Verse 11 for both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all of one. For which reason, this is so good, for which reason he is not ashamed. Okay, can I read that again to you guys? For which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will declare, this is one day what he'll do, I will declare your name to my brethren in the midst of the assembly, I will sing praise to you, and again, I will put my trust in him, and again, here am I, this is the son speaking to the father, here am I and the children whom God has given to me. So his suffering meant this for us, it enabled him to identify with us. And uh, he, is, he is the agent of sanctification. Remember the word sanctify means to set apart. Um, and this is, this is what he is doing. Um, he, is, he is sanctifying us. Now, some people believe that when the word sanctification is used here, he's talking about us being pulled out of the kingdom of darkness and placed into the, the kingdom of God, set apart in that sense. Those who are being sanctified, those who are coming to faith in Jesus Christ, those are who are being pulled out of the world and set apart for the purposes of God. Some people say, well, no, it's really um, the... The, uh, the issue of sanctification, it's the transformation that God is progressively doing in our lives. By the way, as you read the scriptures, what you'll notice is the Bible talks about sanctification in a progressive sense, and the Bible talks about sanctification in a completed sense. There are places where the Bible use, uses uh, the word sanctify in the past tense, and the Bible actually says of us that we've been sanctified. So Look, from the perspective of God, it is a done deal. It's a done deal. 
God sees the work as finished. Um, we in this life, as we're bound by this time-space continuum, do not see that. We see a, a work that needs to be done, and man, it is a big work, right? I mean, God, aren't there times where you say, God, you know, you've got so much work left to do in me? You're like, yeah, pastor, I look at you all the time, <laughs> and I say that. You know, we are a work in progress. Like in a spiritual sense, if you could see our lives, there would be construction signs up all around us, and, and he is doing this work. But, but ultimately, ultimately, this was the plan of God to draw us to himself and then perfect us and make us into the image of his son. And because he is doing this, right? And because we are all one, we are all in process. Never forget that about your brothers and sisters. Because he is doing this work, Jesus Christ is not ashamed of you, and Jesus Christ is not ashamed of me. Amen. All right? In heaven, when you're walking down Glory Street, he's not going to be like, oh my gosh. <laughs> like, I don't even know how they got in. How did they get Peter, get over here. How did they get in? You know, he's not ashamed of you. There may be people in your life that act like they're ashamed. There may be people in your life that, that you've been disaffected from. There may be people in your life that don't like you anymore. There may be people in your life that have defriended you from Facebook or from Instachat or from Snapgram or whatever, you know? I mean, they just, they just don't like you and they're ashamed of you. Well, guess what? God's not. God's not. God is not ashamed of you. And one day, and this is a glorious thing to consider, one day, Jesus Christ is going to declare your name before the Father and all of the holy angels. Man, that is good. That is good. And you know what? You know, your, your sense of self and your sense of esteem has got to come from that. It doesn't come from the world. It doesn't come from your accomplishments. It doesn't come from your good looks. Thank God. <laughs> doesn't come from how fat your wallet is or what kind of car you drive or which gated community you live in or all the accolades or acronyms behind your name. Your sense of who you are and your sense of esteem comes from Christ. And the very fact that he is not ashamed of you. You know what? And even if the whole world denies you and rejects you, God is still on your side. Isn't that, isn't that awesome? That's just so good. It's just so good. Uh, verse 14. So, number one, he, he identifies with us. Number two, he, through his suffering, destroyed the devil and the power of death. Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared, this is Jesus, he shared in the same, why? That through death, the physical destruction of his body, he might destroy him who had the power of death that is the devil. Can I hear an amen here tonight? Amen. And not only that, like you know he's excited. He's like, I ain't done y'all. I'm still, I'm still preaching with my pen. And release those who through the fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. So when he came, look, he did so much when he condescended and came to this earth. Number one, he was numbered with the transgressors. He had identified with you and with me. And as we've been sanctified, taken out of this world and set apart for the purposes of the Father, he is not ashamed to declare our name. Number two is this. When he died on the cross, when he took upon himself a physical, corporeal body, um, you know, the Gnostics used to say that, that Christ, that, that Jesus had no physical body and that when he walked on the sand, he left no he left no footprints because they couldn't reconcile the material world that they called evil and the spiritual world that they called good. But you know what? He had a physical body. Mary did hold him as a babe in her arms. When he, when he hung on the cross, those nails went through his wrists and the spear pierced his side and the crown of thorns was plated and beat down upon his head. And you know what appeared to be a victory for the devil? Okay, the devil's shining moment, because you know this was what he thought. He thought he had been victorious over the Son of God. You know, the, the devil knew exactly who Jesus was. They'd known each other for a long time. Jesus, in fact, said to the devil, and I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. That's fast, by the way. That's 186,000 miles per second, okay? That's fast. Like, like when the devil assaulted uh, the throne of God, God didn't even have to get up. He simply spoke the word and boom, 
right? He was gone. He was kicked out. Uh, but they, the devil knew. The devil fully knew. In fact, the demons called Jesus the Holy One. They were familiar with this Son of God. And what seemed to be a total victory, the, the greatest moment of triumph for the devil was his singular defeat. Because when Jesus Christ died on the cross, he destroyed, this is what he says, he, he destroyed him who had the power of death that is the devil. So that word destroyed means this. It means to render inoperable. I love the way Paul puts this in the church, uh, to the letter, in the letter to the church at Colossae. He was talking about the law and those things that had been written that really uh, convict all of us of sin before God. This is what he says. And he, that is Jesus, has taken it, that writing that was against us, has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross, having disarmed principalities, these are, these are uh, evil entities, having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. The it is the cross. So what appeared to be a total victory for the devil was in fact a total defeat for him and a complete victory for God. You know, this is the, this is the counterintuitive perspective of heaven. People look at the cross and they say, hey, you know, how sad, what a tragic end to a perfect life. And God says, that wasn't a tragic end. That was a purpose I sent my son for. It, was, it wasn't as if he lost when he hung on the cross. He won when he hung on the cross. And he did, didn't just win for the glory of the Father. He won for you and he won for me. 1 John 3, 8 says this, For this reason, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Uh, you know, look, we do not... Your adversary is your adversary. I know that was deep. Your adversary is your adversary. He is an adversary, and, and he's a wily adversary. And we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but principalities and powers. And you know, we've got, we've got to be suited up in the full armor of God. You and I don't stand a chance on our own. But you know what? We're not on our own, brothers and sisters. We're not on our own. We have God on our side. Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. If God be for us, who can be against us, right? I mean, this is the... The declaration of, of the scripture. And this is what happened when he suffered. Not only did he destroy Satan and, his, and the power of death, he released us. He released us from the fear of death. In other words, listen, you and I don't live every day fearing that moment when we're going to take our last breath. Why? Because we know what's going to happen afterwards. Okay, for us... Uh, when we take our last breath here on earth, as it were, we will be taking our first breath in heaven. We will be looking into the eyes that burn like flames of fire for us. It is the beginning of eternal life with God the Father and God the Son. Um, and like Paul said, for me to live is Christ and to die. He didn't say, and to die, man, I'm really worried about that. He didn't say, and to die, you know, what a total bummer. I mean, what a, what a loss. I'm going to have to give up all the things that I worked so hard for in this life. He didn't say that. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. You know, when, when you and I breathe our last, it's not as if we're losing. It is, it is as if. It truly is that we are gaining. And all of this comes through the suffering of the Son. It is through death, right? It is through death. This was what John the Baptist said. Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And you and I, like, we reiterate that and we say that, but if you're Jewish, right? If you're Jewish, what you're thinking is this Lamb of God? Hey, you, are you talking about a sacrifice? Are you talking about an animal that is, that is slain in my place? Are you talking about Passover? Are you talking about the life of that animal in the blood being poured out and it being a substitute for me? Are you talking about me having life through its death? Answer, yes. You know, this is the love of God for you and for me that God loved us so much. He delivered his own son up. And Jesus Christ died a brutal death on the cross so that we could be released from the fear of death. Say amen tonight. That's just good. Verse 16. For indeed, he does not give aid to angels, but he does give aid to the seed of Abraham. 
Therefore, in all things, he had to be made like his brethren. We're still talking incarnation here. That he might be a merciful and faithful high priest. Okay? We're going to talk about the role of the high priest uh, in a couple of weeks. That he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation, big theological term there, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. So he identifies with us. He destroys the power of death. And he becomes our substitute. He becomes our substitute. He, is, he, he made propitiation. Halaskamai is the Greek word that's used here. Um, it means this. It means that the wrath of God was, was appeased. It means the wrath, the full wrath and, and fury of the Father. Because remember, God is a just God. He is righteous. God is a, a righteous God. That means everything he does is right. And he demands this from his creation. He is righteous and he is just. So any unrighteousness, because God is righteous, he sees all unrighteousness, and because he's just, he also has to. It's in his nature. It's in his nature. He has to execute justice on all unrighteousness. And you know what? If you say, well, that's not fair. That's not fair of God. I don't think God should do that. God can't deny himself. This is the very character and nature of God. If God ceased to be just, he would no longer be God, all right? By the way, he certainly wouldn't be a God that you would want to worship, all right? Because then what is the determining factor for justice? Who determines what should be punished and what shouldn't be punished? You know, the, the, the greatest of sins will be punished and the slightest of sins from our perspective will be punished as well. And when he hung on the cross, when Jesus hung on the cross, the, the wrath and fury of God that was going to be executed on all unrighteousness was appeased in the sacrifice of the son because Jesus took for you and for me what we deserve to pay for all of eternity. That's propitiation. That's halaskamai. That's that is God the Son hanging in your place. You know, I know life is hard sometimes. I know it. I know life's hard sometimes. I know, I know sometimes we have unmet expectations. I know sometimes we're disappointed. You know, there's prayers that go unanswered. There's healings that we've been asking for that don't come. There's relationships that we want to have reconciled that don't get reconciled. You know, there's needs that we have that don't get met the way that we want them to be met. I fully understand that. And guess what? I'm human too, okay? You don't think that those things have happened in my life where, where things haven't worked out the way I've wanted them to and, 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 full disclosure, and, and I've not gone, God, really? Really? God, have you ever said that to God before? Don't lie. Raise your hand right now. Okay, Really? In that moment, really, but you know what? You can't, you can't, you can't dwell there. You cannot, you can, but you don't want to dwell there. You don't want to dwell there. Pastor, where do I go? You go to the cross. You go to the cross. You go to halaskama. You go to propitiation. You go to the one who inserted himself, pushed you out of the way. I want you to think about this. Pushed you out of the way and hung on the cross himself and took the, the full weight of the fury of God's wrath so that you did not have to endure it for all of eternity, okay? And you know what? By the way, hell is a place of eternal suffering. And you, you still, if you die without Christ, you will suffer for all of eternity and you will never fully pay off the penalty of your sin. There's no like purgatory where you pay the portion that you're guilty of, and then you have an opportunity for upward mobility, okay? <laughs> that's, not, that's not in the Bible. It's not in the Bible. This is why he said it's finished. This is how definitive it is for the author to this book, and you're going to hear him say once and for all, once and for all, once and for all, over and over and over, because that's how he viewed the sacrifice of Christ. It was that great. Listen, it was that great, and it was the thing that that this believer at least always came back to. And I want to encourage you. 
is the thing that you have to come back to as well. He suffered for us. He was incarnate. He suffered for us. And this has enabled him to be merciful, okay? He knows how to, to extend personally mercy for you and for me. Mercy is this, that we do not get what we deserve. That's mercy. Like in those moments where you're like, God, I, I need mercy. You know, I... I know I don't deserve it, but God, I need it. And the son has this unique ability because he walked through it. He has this unique ability to understand exactly what it is that you need. So I mean in a personal sense. I mean you tonight. I mean you and your circumstance. You by name. The son knows exactly what you need. Not only that, he's faithful. He's a faithful high priest. He will always come through for you. It may not look like you want it to look. Um, it may not come in the timing that you expect it. Okay, God is rarely early, but he's never late. Okay, you know that. It may not come in the time that you expected, but he knows how to be faithful. Verse 18, for in that he himself has suffered being tempted, tested, this word is used uh, when, he, when the pressure was on on that Tuesday of Passion Week, and the Pharisees, scribes, Herodians were, were tempting him, the, pressing him. Okay, he endured that. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to aid. What does the word aid mean? What does it mean? It means to help. Those who are being tempted, who's that? That's, <laughs> are you being tempted? You're like, yeah, like right now I want to leave. No, I don't. <laughs> no. No, you don't. Are you... Are you in the middle of temptation? Is temptation knocking at your door? Um, are, are there subtle things that are happening in your life that the devil is just calling? He's calling. He's beckoning. You know what? He's never going to stop in this life. Really? Do you think he's going to give you a break? Do you really think he's going to give you a pass? He is equal opportunity, and this is what he wants. He wants to destroy you. He wants to steal every good thing that God has for you. And in the moment of temptation, when the pressure is on, um, or you're being pressed on by the circumstances of your life, guess who's there to help you? God. The Son is there to help you. Jesus is there to help you. The first place that you should always go is to Jesus Christ. First place you should go. You know, sometimes, and, and we're here for you. We're here for you. We are here to minister to you um, and encourage you in the things of God. But listen, this pastoral team is not Jesus Christ. It's just not. And you know what? We, we're just a signpost. We can pray and we can direct, but ultimately the one that you need and I need, his name is Jesus. He's the only one who can deliver. He's the only one who can save. And tonight he wants to help. My question is this. Are you willing to cry out for help? Are you willing to ask? You know, are you, are you too, are you, are you above asking? Are you so self-reliant? You know, sometimes, sometimes we go into cycles of sin because we just refuse to, to ask for help. And he's waiting to give aid to those of us who are in need. Chapter 3, verse 1. Therefore, holy brethren and sisterin, <laughs> therefore, okay, here's your application. Whenever you see therefore, you have to find out what is there for. And uh, he just loaded us up with a whole bunch of theology, awesome theology. Therefore, holy breth brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling. In other words, God is, God is called, and you have responded. God, in a sense, is called from heaven through the sending of his son to this earth, and you have responded. This is what he says. Consider the apostle and high priest of our confession, Christ Jesus, who was faithful to him, who appointed him as Moses also was faithful in all his house. So there's this brand new family, the family of God. This is how he addresses them. God has done this powerful work, holy brethren, holy sistren. We've responded to this heavenly calling of God, and this is what he says. He says, consider. He says, consider the apostle, the messenger of the father and the high priest the one who stands between God and you. Okay, there's one mediator between man and God, and that is the man Christ Jesus. That was the role of the high priest, to stand between the people and God. 
And Jesus is really the fulfillment of that. All of that was a foreshadow looking to Yeshua, who is the mediator, the single mediator. The church does not stand between you and God. The Roman Catholic Church does not stand between you and God. Pastors are not vicarious representations of Jesus Christ here on this earth. There's one mediator. Pastor, are you saying that I can go to God directly through the Son? Yes, I am. Yes, I am. God has granted you that opportunity. And this, this is what he says, okay? He says, consider or fix your eyes um, or fasten yourself. Fasten yourself. I was thinking about, about this today, and uh, you know, I have a Rottweiler. And I love my dog so much. He's such a good boy. He's a beast. He's like 140 pounds. He's, he's huge dog. He's huge. And, he's, and you know, it's so, it's so great because... Um, you know, when someone gets too close to the fence and my dog barks, it sounds like he has rabies. I'm not kidding. He's like, la, 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 and spits flying everywhere. And, and I mean, he's just, he's just a, he's a beast. I mean, he, he really is. I think he's in the book of Revelation. He's, he is, he ascends up out of the sea. You know, I'm, I'm worried sometimes. But he is, he's an animal, yeah, literally. And, um, and you know that, um, I love that because if you jump my fence, you're not, you're, you're leaving a body part behind. I'm just telling you, I'm telling you, which is why I got him. But when he fastens onto something, when he, when my Rottweiler fastens onto something, that dog does not let go. And it is impossible. Like if he really has got his jaws into something, it is impossible to get that thing out of his mouth. No matter how hard you pull um, no matter how hard you cajole, the only way for me to get it out of his mouth is to get like a piece of meat or something like that. Uh, Boston, come on, let it go. He's all, ah, you know, and, uh, and he's just distracted, but he's locked on. His jaws are locked on, and this is what the author is saying. You need to fasten your eyes. You need to fix your eyes. You need to lock yourself onto the person of Christ, and no matter how hard the devil tugs on you, some of you are being tugged here tonight by the devil and by the world. And you've got an option, all right? And what he is saying is this, you need to lock on to the Lord. You need to lock on to him. And no matter how hard you're being tugged on, no matter how difficult the circumstance may be, you, this is the exhortation, don't let go of Jesus Christ. Don't let go of the confession that you've made to follow him. And so now in this portion, what he's going to do is he's going to talk about how Jesus is greater than Moses because they're starting to look back to the law and they're starting to elevate Moses. By the way, you remember that John said this, that the law came through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. And on the Mount of Transfiguration, there were two, there were two dudes hanging next to Jesus, right? One on the right, one on the left. You guys remember who that was? One was Moses, one was Elijah. What did God say? God said, hey, I want you to hear the law. Did he say that? No, he said, Peter is like, oh, this is awesome. Tabernacles, one, two, three. Moses, Jesus, Elijah. And God says, this is my beloved son. Hear ye him. It sounds better in the King James Version. Hear ye him. So we see in the gospel accounts that Christ is exalted over Moses. But but now he methodically goes through and he proves how Jesus is greater than Moses. Verse three, for this one has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses inasmuch as he who built the house is more honored than the house. For every house is built by someone, but he who built all things is God. You gotta love the way he thinks. And Moses indeed was faithful. So like, you know, this is not a diss on Moses, no shame to him. Moses indeed was faithful in all his house as a servant, right? That's what Moses was, for a testimony of those things which would be spoken afterwards. So, you know, Moses lived a faithful life. But Christ as a son, so not just a servant in the house, but Christ as a son over his own house, over his own house, whose house we are, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm. Notice this conditional statement. If we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm to the end. So this is what he says. He says, 
You guys are losing sight. You're drifting back to the old covenant. You're looking to Moses. And the reality is this, that Jesus Christ is greater than Moses. Yeah, Moses was a faithful servant. God gave testimony to that. In uh, Numbers 12, 7, this was what God said of Moses, talking about all those who serve and the uniqueness of his relationship with Moses. He said, not so with my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my house. I speak with him face to face, even plainly, and not in dark sayings. But as exalted as Moses was, the author to this book says that the son is worthy of more glory because he is greater. And these are the reasons that he's greater. Number one, he's the builder of the house. He's the builder of the house. Number two, he's not just a servant in the house. He is the son of the in the house, he is the son of his own house. And this is the third thing, the house is his. The house is his. Now, guess what the house is? The house is not the tabernacle. The house is not the physical temple. The house is us. We, the children of the living God, are the house of the living God in which God himself dwells. I mean, this is amazing. First Peter chapter 2, verse 5 says this, You also as living stones are being built up, a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices to God through Jesus Christ. So he is greater. And then the author gives this exhortation that comes in a conditional statement. And he says, he says this, number one, hold fast, keep secure. Um, it means to hold on to possessions tightly. Um, this was a nautical term as well. And uh, to hold fast was used when a ship was going through a storm and you were keeping course, you were staying on course. The, 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 the point of your destination was established and you were staying on that track. That was your trajectory. And so he's saying, listen, keep the course. Stay on track. Don't get off track. Don't be misdirected. Not even a single degree. Hold on to that confession of faith that you have made with confidence and rejoicing. In other words, have full assurance in the finished work of Christ on the cross from you because from that comes your joy. From that comes your joy. You know, uh, we are, part of the fruit of the Spirit is joy. You know, this is what the Bible says. Love, joy, peace, patience. But we're also called to rejoice. That's a command. And so from the work of the Holy Spirit, as our focus is on the gospel, there are eternal wells or springs of joy that rise up within us. And this is what we're commanded to do. We turn that into a verb. This is what rejoicing is. We turn that into a verb and we express our joy to God in praise. That's what rejoicing is. It is expressing our joy to God in praise. And the root of that is the confession of our faith, okay? Your rejoicing is not in the circumstances of your life. Your, rejoice, your rejoicing uh, doesn't come just when you get uh, the pay raise. Your rejoicing doesn't come, and this is a reason to rejoice, but it doesn't just come when your prayers have finally been answered and you're no longer a single person, but you're about to get married, you know? That's a great reason to rejoice, don't get me wrong. But you know, there's deeper reasons to rejoice in that. And the deeper reason is this, all that God has done for you and for me. And so he says, he says, be steadfast. Hold that hope firm. Listen, hold that hope firm to the end. That's what he says. The devil wants you to fall short. The, the devil wants you to quit before the whole thing is done. And the exhortation here by this author is this, man, you need to hold that confession of faith all the way to the end till you see him face to face. Verse seven, therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion in the day of the trial in the wilderness where your fathers tested me and tried me and saw my works 40 years. Therefore, I was angry with that generation and said they always go astray in their heart and they have not known my ways. So, listen, this is not good. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Uh, we're going to talk about this, this issue of rest and the failure of the children of Israel in the wilderness um, because it was 
absolutely significant, and they lost out. And this is a, an example that's laid out in this book of a path not to follow. But notice with, with me in verse 7, he's talking about Psalm 95, verses 7 to 11, and he says, therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, look, I just, can I take a little tangent for a second? As the Holy Spirit says, who does the author of the book of Hebrews attribute the, the book of Psalms to? The, whole, the Holy Spirit. He says it right here, Psalm 95. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says. So remember with me that the, the greatest commentary on the Bible is the Bible itself. And so this is what we learn here. Number one, that the New Testament authors understood that the Old Testament canon was breathed by God himself. Number two, as you read this, I want you to notice that the way it's interpreted is literal, okay? It's literal. And this is important. The, the author doesn't take this allegorically or metaphorically. Uh, he's saying, hey, that was a real life circumstance that has real life implications that we are to learn from. And he lays out a hermeneutic or a science for us in, in interpretation. And by that I mean this, you and I do not have the freedom to make it up as we go along, okay? When I do um, small group studies, you will never hear me say, well, what does this mean to you? I'll never say that. And if you're leading small group studies, don't ever say to people, what does this mean to you? Because it doesn't matter what it means to you. What matters is what it means. Do you understand what I'm saying? <laughs> I mean, what is God saying? That's really the issue. Now, you can say, how does this apply to your life? But it's not as if we can just make it up. Well, I think this, or I think that. This means this to me, and this means that. You know what? Who cares what your opinion is? And who cares what my opinion is? And the church right now is in this really shaky state where people are making it up as they go along. I shared with you last week um, the, what the Church of England has been implementing in their schools. And I shared this morning, the Church of Sweden, I don't know if you guys heard this, but the Church of Sweden, you know, that's the church that's in Sweden. There's like two million people that are represented in this church. The church is now saying to their priests and to their pastors that they can no longer use the singular masculine personal pronoun he in connection with God. You can't, you can't do that. This is what they're saying. You can't do that anymore. We need to be sensitive to those who have transgender dysphoria. And we, we know that God's not male. And so we're not going to associate a singular masculine personal pronoun to God. Not only that, but they said you also can't use, you can't refer to God as the Lord. Can you imagine that? You, I, and I'm like, man, how do we say king of kings and... Can we not say praise the Lord anymore? Praise the, you fill in the blank, whatever. And this is what I mean. Like, this is, where, this is where it's going. And that's probably what they say. Praise the, hey, you fill in the blank. Whatever works for you, whatever it means for you. Um, and that is absolutely not the way that God wants us to handle his holy word. Hey, the third thing here that I see is that the intention of the writing of uh, the Bible is that we would apply it to our lives. And this is exactly what he does. He says, look back and learn from their example. Remember, Paul said this in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. He was identifying some incidences that, is that even a word? Incidences? Incidency? Incidence I? I don't know. Some things that happened in the Old Testament. <laughs> and he said, these things were written for our example. And so clearly the expectation is that you and I, when we, when we study and read the word of God, are applying it to our lives um, and check this out, warning number two of the seven warnings in the book. He says, verse 12, beware, beware, brethren and sisteren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief and departing from the living God. Like, this is serious. But exhort one another daily while it's called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ if, listen, Second conditional statement, for we have become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast, how long? To the, end. to the end. While it is said, today if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. So look, he says, be beware. Okay, warning, present, active, imperative, which means this, you have the power to understand completely what's being spoken here. 
You have the power to understand it, and you have the responsibility to respond to it. And there's something that's happening in your lives. This is what he's saying to them. There's something that's happening in your lives that is a danger to you. That there's evilness in your heart, an evil heart of unbelief that is leading you down the road of departing from the living God. Now listen, we just read in the beginning of chapter 2 that they were drifting, imperceptible drifting. You know, decisions that were being made that were small decisions that, that for them weren't these big decisions like, hey, I'm leaving Christianity. I'm not putting my faith in Christ anymore. That wasn't it. There were small decisions, compromises, and these small decisions were leading them to a place where uh, this was their trajectory, that they were departing, a heart of unbelief, departing from the gospel and leaving their relationship with God, which had come to them as a promise, a fulfilled promise of the person of Jesus Christ. And he warns them, he warns them because what had happened in their lives was their hearts had become hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. You know, this sin is deceitful. Sin promises what it will never deliver. Sin promises life, it promises satisfaction, it promises joy, it promises experience. And all of that is a lie because what it delivers to you is death. That's what it delivers in the book of James. When we sin, we're enticed by the wickedness of our own heart. And, and when it's full grown, the sin in our life, this is what he says, it brings forth the fruit of death. That's a fact. The devil is a liar. Listen, he is behind every temptation and every sin. And he is saying to you that sin is going to bring something to your life that it will never bring. And when you and I yield to it and we give in to it, what happens is this. There is a scleroo of our heart, a hardening. We get our word uh, sclerosis from this. It happens to our arteries, you know, when we eat it in and out too much, okay? There's a hardening. Your arteries are made by God to be flexible. But if you eat too much of the wrong thing and you don't exercise, there's a hardening that happens to your arteries. There's a building up of cholesterol. Um, there's, it it, it become, becomes more and more difficult for the blood to get through, and ultimately what happens is you have a stroke or you have a heart attack or something like that because there's a hardening that's happened. There's an inflexibility in your physical arteries, and the author is saying, hey, this is, this is what's happened to you. You've been yielding to sin, and your heart has become hard to God. There's an inflexibility. There's an unwillingness to yield, to say yes to God, to submit to Him. And as you've been walking down this road of sin, you've been deceived, thinking that sin's going to give something to you that it can never give to you. It, in fact, is affecting your, your faith. It is affecting uh, your steadfastness in the confession of faith that you once made. And now what's happening is this. You're not believing in God like you used to believe. He warns them, you know, maybe this is, maybe this is you tonight. Maybe, maybe you're not on the, the far end of this spectrum, but look, maybe the small steps are being taken in your life right now, and there's this voice in your head, this is not the right way. This is not the will of God. You shouldn't be doing this, you know. And by the way, that's not just the conscience that God has given you. That's the Holy Spirit speaking to your life. And the more you and I resist that voice in our life that is the voice of God, the harder it is for us to hear him when he speaks. It's just the truth. Pretty soon what happens is this, our ears have been stopped up because there's so much sin in our life and we no longer hear that voice, that, that conviction in our heart that was so, it was so hard. You know, that first step of compromise that was taken and you know, there was just a grieving and a sorrow and you knew, like you knew it was like a, a knife was going in your heart. You knew it was wrong. But the more you walk down the road, the, the less and less you feel because you've become numbed. You've become numb to God. You don't even hear his voice anymore. And you know you misconstrue that as a free pass from God. Well, I guess it's okay. I guess God doesn't care. I guess it doesn't matter. It's not that God doesn't care. It's that you've stopped hearing. You've stopped listening. He said this, he who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And you know, the amazing thing about God is this. If this is you tonight, God loves you. God has not taken his eyes off of you. 
God has a purpose and a plan for your life, and it's one step back. This is the amazing thing about God. You don't do penance. You don't work your way back. If this is you, and you know, you're, you're looking at your life, and you've been going like this, and where you are right now, if you were to evaluate, you would say, hey, I haven't departed from God, but I've definitely drifted from him. The amazing thing about God is this, that his son for us is a merciful, faithful high priest, and it takes, it takes a simple response. This is why he says today. Exhort one another while it's called today. Pastor, what are you doing right now? What are you doing right now? I'm exhorting. I'm exhorting while it's called today, right now. Pastor, it's kind of uncomfortable. I don't care <laughs> because you're worth it. You're worth it. And the word of God to you and to me is not tomorrow or down the road or you know what, when you get older, the word of God for you and for me is right here, right now. Don't harden your heart as in the rebellion because the mercy of God is looking to pull you right back in and to refresh and to renew and pull out that, that hardened heart that hardened heart of unbelief that's been deceived by sin, and God will place in you a brand new heart that's tender, a heart of flesh. By that, it means a heart that's tender and sensitive to Him. He'll renew you like that. That's the goodness of God. That's the goodness of God in our lives. And all of that, listen, all of that, all of that is compelled in our lives. It's driven, it's motivated in our lives by the suffering of the Son, by what God did for us. If, if the cross of Christ is not sufficient motivation for you and for me to walk with God, nothing else will be ever, ever. And if our hearts can't be moved by the suffering of the Son for us in our place, then we've got a worse problem. Then we, we, then we really need to pray. Tonight, I want to just encourage all of us. Look, this is for all of us. And you know what? Maybe things are great in your walk with God, but the truth is this, that we all need to be refreshed, and we all need to be renewed, and He is ready in the heavenly places to do that in our lives tonight. Let's pray together. Father, thank You. Lord, thank You for Your Word. It's just so good. God, it's so, so refreshing. It's, it just resets us. Father, and it keeps us focused and on target. We love your word. We're hungry for your word. We love that you talk to us personally. God, who are we that you would even love us the way you do? We're in an attitude of prayer. Listen, I, I just want to, I want to have a, a, a moment of transparency and honesty tonight, okay? And it doesn't matter what anybody else thinks. Tonight, maybe you've never put your trust and faith in Jesus Christ. And you know, as I've been speaking tonight, the message of the Bible is exclusive. God does love you, but he's provided one single way for your sin to be forgiven. And tonight, if you're not a Christian, you have to deal with this. You have to deal with the a Savior, the Son of God, who died on the cross. And that God the Father sent His own Son. Why did He send the Son? Why did Jesus have to die? Because there was no other way for you or for me to be made right in relationship with God. There's only one way. Tonight, Maybe God's tugging on your heart and you know you need to take a step of faith and you need to believe in Jesus. You tonight need to trust in him. You've sinned like I've sinned against God. We've all sinned. We all deserve an eternity of punishment because God is that righteous and he's that just. But he is ready now. He's ready now and willing to extend mercy to you and grace to you if you just come to him turning away from your sin, sin and trusting in the Son. If this is you tonight, you're not a Christian, and tonight you know you need God and you want to be right with Him, you want the forgiveness of your sins, you want that fear of death to be gone, you want the assurance of everlasting life. Tonight, if this is you, I want to pray for you right where you're sitting. 
Will you respond to the gospel right now? God is calling you now. This is you tonight. Uh, This is what I want you to do. I want to pray for you. I want you to raise your hand. If you want to take that step of faith and believe in Jesus Christ, would you raise your hand tonight? Would you just stretch it up high? Let me see who you are so I can pray for you. Tonight, as our eyes are closed, as our heads are bowed, maybe for you, it's not that you're not saved, you're a Christian, but, but you know you're not walking with God. Look, there's, there have been compromises. There has been a drifting in your life. And you know, as I was speaking, there was conviction, and that comes from God, and God is calling you. He's speaking to you to lay down these things that have been deceiving you and distracting you, to have a heart that's renewed to have a reset in your life to align yourself once again to the confession of faith that you've made it's not maybe that you've departed from a confession of faith but you know the truth is this that your life does not line up with the confession of faith and those two things need to be in alignment And so, look, all eyes are closed, all heads are bowed. This is a a private moment. I want want to pray for you, but tonight needs to be a night where there's a moment that you have with God that you can look back on and acknowledge as a moment that you lined yourself up with Him. And so tonight, if this is you, Christian, and you need God to do a fresh work in your life. Would you raise your hand tonight so I can pray for you? God bless you. I see your hand over here in the back on the left. Right here in the back. God bless you too. In the back over here. Over here on my right. God bless you. Anybody else? Stretch your hand up high. I see your hand here. I see your hand here. In the front. Awesome. Here in the back. He loves you guys. You know, he's never stopped. He's never stopped loving you. One more moment before we close this up in prayer. Don't resist. If you're resisting tonight, don't resist. Don't fight against God. Anybody else? Awesome. Thank you. Father, we're so thankful tonight that you don't quit, you don't give up, God, you don't abandon your children, and God, we ask, I ask for these, and I do ask, God, for others in this room, I ask for all of us, Father, refresh, renew, God, take these hearts and change the Hardness, transform the hearts from hardened to tender and malleable and flexible and open and receptive and humble. Your word says that if we humble ourselves under your mighty hand, that you will exalt us in due time. And Father, we pray tonight that as these lives are humbled before you, God, you would pour out You would rain upon them fresh water, God, your Holy Spirit, and that you'd cause their lives to be filled with the fruit of the Spirit for the glory of God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Let's all stand tonight. Hey, if you need prayer tonight, maybe, um, well, whatever the reason, I want to encourage you. We have elders and their wives here in the front um, who would love to pray with you and for you. Stay close to the heart of God. Stay close to the heart of God. Fasten. Fasten your focus on the person of Jesus Christ this week. And don't let anything distract you from him. In Jesus' name, amen.